Welcome to Super Context, a podcast autopsy of media. How we consume it and how it informs our everyday culture. I'm Christian Sager, a writer and a designer. And I'm Charlie Bennett, a librarian and a radio raconteur. Each episode is us trying to understand the entertainment world that we all live in just a little bit better. Today's episode is about Danny, the champion of the world, by Roald Dahl. This 1975 children's book is about the conflicts between class and an idealized relationship between a child and their parent. We talk about Dahl's notoriously disagreeable personality while trying to reconcile it with this genuinely joyful story. You can find show notes at patreon.com slash supercontext, where you can leave a comment. Or you can write us an email at supercontextpodcast at gmail.com Would you like any of the parents in a Roald Dahl book to be your parent? So bedtime's a trip at my house, uh, especially these days because we're reading chapter books. Are you familiar with the difference between a picture book and a chapter book? I'm not. It sounds like you guys are dropping some uh, psilocybin right before you read these chapter books. Oh, holy hell. I wish. No, I don't wish because I don't need to puke in the middle of a, uh, you know, a good story time. No, uh, the chapter book is the book broken into chapters. It's very straightforward. Gotcha. You graduate essentially from board books to picture books to chapter books. Okay, so this to... book today is a chapter book. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Um, there's a little bit of wiggle room when you have a illustrated chapter book yeah. or a um, semi-illustrated chapter book. Until finally you get to what you and I think of as books. And the so from the format for today's book, chapter books are, I mean, I would guess like the chapters themselves are probably under a thousand words. You know, I don't think I could judge the word count, but yeah, you, you're short. going in the right direction. Yeah. I mean, chapters that could be read in the 10 or 15 minutes before bedtime. Gotcha. Okay. So you have read this then to one of your children before bedtime, a day at a time per chapter? Exactly. When I was young, I was crazy for Roald Dahl. And I actually have the 1973 um, re-release of Charlie and the Chocolate Factory in trade paperback that I read when I was a kid. And uh, I, I remember we bought this uh, box set for the kids and, you know, a contemporary box set with all the Quentin Blake illustrations and all of the bright colors, you know? Uh, and it was like, okay, we've got it. When can we read it to the kids? Mm-hmm. And we started with like Charlie and the chocolate factory and the great glass elevator. And then it was time to read Danny, the champion of the world. And I said to my wife, let's switch. You do the twins for the next you know, a few weeks and I will put Lila Jane to bed because I want to read Danny champion of the world to her. Okay. So this is a book that you were familiar with from a kid. And so you have fondness for it in that respect. And then you have an added layer of fondness on it because you're now, it's like a bonding experience with your daughter. Yeah. I read Charlie and the chocolate factory with my kids and it doesn't hold up quite as much as I would like it to. Yeah. It's a little, it's a little bing, bang, boom in the writing. Lots yeah. of exclamation points, lots of all caps sentences, lots of just, it's a little much. Is and there it a lot appeal. of um, discrepancy between the films and the book? Oh, you know, I, I don't even want to get down into that uh, particular mud pile. Well, I ask because I realized today this is the only Roald Dahl book I've ever read. Really? Yeah. Not a one. Yeah, apparently not. I think I've known about it because I've seen all these movies, mm-hmm. but I don't think I've ever actually sat down and read any of these. When I was a kid, huh. it was all Shel Silverstein. And so yeah. I think I just missed this particular area, except for like, you know, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory was on TV when I was a kid. So I grew well, up don't with forget, that. It was Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory when it was a movie. I mean, I think it depends on whether Tim Burton was involved or not, doesn't it? Oh, my God. Did Tim Burton direct movies when you were a kid? 
<laughs> and by kid, I mean 35. Um, the thing I want to say about this is that Charlie and the Chocolate Factory and those really um, overdone, holy shit kind of kid stories that Roald Dahl wrote. Yeah. I remember them very fondly. But reading them as an adult to my children, I don't quite get the zing from them that I once got. So question then, did you read them on your own as a child or did your parents read them to you? My memory is of reading it on my own. Okay. I might have had them read to me, but I remember slowly destroying my copy of Charlie and the Chocolate Factory by just reading it and rereading it and rereading it. And I remember the hardback of Danny and the Champion of the World, oh, you know, that taking it nice. home from the library and reading it. Here's my follow up. Yes. Um, because this is going to be important uh, in our later conversation about the themes in this book. When you were a child in the 70s and you were reading this, yes. did you think that is so cool? I wish my dad were like that. Or did yes. you? Yes. You did. Okay. Yes. There's no other answer. I totally <laughs> was into the relationship yeah. that was established between the dad and the son, the kind of trust that was between them both. Yeah. You know, it, and it wasn't just like, one. I wish that I could be Danny to my dad as much as I wished that uh, my dad could be Danny's dad to me. Right. Yeah. Uh, that's something I think is going to be really important to this episode. So I wanted to establish that early on. Okay. And I read this to my daughter and I loved it even more than I remembered it. What do you think it is then as an adult reading it to a child that makes you love it more? Uh, certainly the comparison to other kids' stories, you know, the, the Charlie and the Chocolate Factory style, but also there's some for real darkness in Danny, the champion of the world. That's not like there just to make you feel scared and then saved. Like it actually looks at some real things about the world and yet it still is a warm and comfortable story. You know what it reminded me of? You're going to laugh at this. I'm ready. It felt like a Stephen King novel. I believe you. They That's totally, totally have right. the same value system in the way that uh, they don't like bullies. There's an implicit uh, kind of class war thing going on. Uh-huh. And Blue collar nobility e- and yeah. spastic violence from strangers. Uh-huh. And, and with like a macabre dark undertone. Yeah. I'm not going to laugh. I'm totally with you. So then I think our mission in this episode is to figure out a way to talk about how this book was made by Roald Dahl and his publishers and how it was received, but then also to think about these larger themes in the sense of what did they mean for us as as children and, and what kind of values did they create for us that we grew up into? Yeah. And then subsequently, like, what kind of values do we hope they're instilling in the next generation? And for me in particular, looking at why does Danny Champion of the World somehow exceed my expectations as mm-hmm. an adult revisiting mm-hmm. where other doll books have not? Okay. Sounds good. Let's dive into it then. So... Everybody, if you are unfamiliar with this book, because I was, I didn't even realize this was one of Roald Dahl's uh, oeuvre. Uh, This book came out in 1975. It is classified as a children's book, although Charlie has distinguished between that and chapter books for us. So I think this is (laughs) a little different. If you've never read it, it's prose. Uh, It's not, there aren't pictures on every page, but I'd say there's probably like a drawing every three or four pages, maybe. Yeah. Uh, and they're real quick and loose. And we're going to talk about the illustrators involved as well. Uh, so let's talk about Roald Dahl. I'm sure all of our audience has at least a image of the chocolate factory in their head. All right. That, that book has made it far too far into the world. But let's talk about him from scratch, right? Roald Dahl, whose name is spelled R-O-A-L-D. Uh, Roald Dahl, D-A-H-L. He's a British writer, was a British writer. He is an immensely popular writer. He has sold over 250 million books worldwide. He was a former fighter pilot 
And in fact, some of his early stories are about that very thing. Uh, He became popular in the 40s with a mixture of kids' books and adult stories. And in fact, if you ever find yourself picking up Switch Bitch by Roald Dahl. (laughs) I'm familiar with that one, but I I know that term because I think it's been used by punk bands before. Oh, yeah, for sure. I mean, Switch Bitch, I think, came out the year after Danny, the champion of the world. Okay. It's a collection of short stories, including the one where the woman kills somebody with a leg of lamb and then cooks it and feeds it to the police to get rid of the evidence. So it's an EC comic story. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, The story about the the bet with the lighter and the finger. Oh, you've mentioned this before. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And also a wife swapping story with a Rod Serling twist at the end. Well, let me tell you, that is going to become eerily relevant when we get to his biography <laughs> later on. Um, the point is, Roald Dahl is not just a kid's writer. He did he went to even darker places in adult fiction. Uh, and also memoir. His stories are known, and let's quote here, for macabre subject matter and unexpected endings. The uh, Danny, the champion of the world was the next book after Charlie and the great glass elevator that also came out about 10 years after Charlie and the chocolate factory. Um, This was kind of the midpoint of Roald Dahl's kids stories because James and the giant peach, Charlie, and the chocolate factory, Charlie, and the great glass elevator. uh, They're practically surreal. You know, they, they are written with, a lot of verve and excitement and exclamation points and almost magic. Danny champion of the world is a very naturalistic story. So then we've also got the big hits that have really made their way into consciousness also because of film. Uh, We've got the fantastic Mr. Fox, the BFG, and then the one I'm the most fond of, of course, the witches, uh, the Nick rogue movie, which (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> which is a very bizarre idea of something made for children in the 80s. Yeah, the BFG and the Witches, which are late in his career, are both um, oddities if, say, what you're really familiar with is Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. And then there's like this weird shared universe thing going on, too, because yeah. a lot of people got real excited about that, that the BFG appears in this book as a story that Danny's father tells him. Yeah, that he makes up. Yeah, yeah. And uh, just to kind of finish off Dahl as a writer, he did write novels and short stories, but he also wrote screenplays, and he uh, even helped write the screenplay for the original Charlie and the Chocolate Factory adaptation, Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. Uh, He's an award-winning. The Witches won the Whitbread Award. Not that I've ever heard of that. Um, Now... His stories and everyone's love for his stories give kind of a a warm feeling in one's heart. Roald Dahl, entertainer of millions. But uh, flip over any rock, right? There are two portraits of Roald Dahl. I'm quoting. One version paints him as the heroic World War II vet who started writing children's fantasies to entertain his own children. Another paints him as a crank who tormented his publishers and aired anti-Semitic opinions in interviews. In fact, rereading some of your favorite doll classics may be unnerving. Okay. I did learn about doll being a shitbag, you know, before this moment in time. Mm-hmm. I was kind of prepared for some unpleasantness as I revisited these books from my youth squeaky clean it's astonishing how little of this nasty man exists in these books this is eerily relevant to something that we talked about in a recent mini-sode for our patrons about being able to separate the art from the artist and you at the time said no i cannot but you clearly Uh, have with him remember what i said though the little caveat except for when roll doll well, no, no, no. If I learned about the work yeah. long before I learn about the person and if the person's dead, you know, like that makes it really easy. If, if it's a freestanding body of work and 
I have some enjoyment of it. And then someone says, oh, by the way, that person who is now gone, shitty person. Okay. It can almost keep me from having to uh, conflate the two. Well, anybody listening who's not a patron, consider signing up as a patron and you will be able to hear us talk about this for about, I don't know, 10 or 15 minutes on a recent mini-sode. But also off and on on many episodes. Yes, it's true. In the past. It comes up a lot. But uh, I, I I wanted to ask, like in lieu of that though, when you know you're about to read this to your kid, do you like, do you have to like scan through it real quick beforehand before you agree to read it and be like, okay, I, I know this is on the level. Like, what's I trusted the... my memory that there was nothing really obvious. Mm-hmm. Like, there's no swastikas right in any of these books, and mm-hmm. so. I knew that it would probably go past my kids too, Mm -hmm. if there was hidden stuff. And so I I didn't rescan it, but I did read warily at first until I found myself completely back in, back in the warm embrace of this story. Um, I ask because as we'll find out later on, there have been a number of parents who have come out, not just against this book, but many of his books, uh, even recently and said that they should be removed from libraries because of their bad examples of parenting and role modeling. And, um, so anyways, I, that, that we should put that on the table that there are lots yeah. of people out there who, who do read this stuff and go, Oh, this is offensive. There's a darkness to all of these books. Um, Sometimes it's just a little bit of uh, sort of teasing or um, rudeness. And sometimes it's uh, it's like a really pessimistic view of people mm. and, a, and a really grotesque assessment of human nature. Yeah. And, and eerily, this is also a uh, theme that you and I have run into over and over again on Super Context over the years, which is that uh, it confirms our worldview. And in fact, <laughs> uh, I think it's it, it's possible to say that this may, in fact, be where our worldview came from in a lot of ways, right? Like w- works like this or our reading of Stephen King as children. Yeah, I mean, thinking about Danny, the champion of the world, as a first draft of a Stephen King story almost makes me wonder if, you know, did I mm-hmm. read Danny, mm-hmm. the champion of the world and become fascinated by it and then see the echoes right. in the Stephen King Okay, let's talk about how Danny, the champion of the world, was written. Mm-hmm. And and interestingly, we have to go into some serious biographical detail because some things that happened in his life seem to have been the seed for some of the stuff that happened in the book. Yeah. So, okay. So, in 1953, he married an actress named Patricia Neal. And here's the synchronicity weirdness of this show again, Charlie. Uh, just today... I saw an announcement that there's a biopic coming out about Patricia Neal's life, huh. uh, portraying everything that we're about to talk about here. Okay. So I, I might up, not people. want to watch that movie. Uh, so yeah, they, they were married. They had five children. Then in 1965, Neal suffered a series of strokes and these left her paralyzed and unable to speak. This is from the official bio. Dahl worked closely with medical professionals to help with her recovery, and she learned to walk and talk again. There are other versions of that story where he is horrifically mean to his ailing wife, and we'll get into that later. Uh, Picking back up with the bio, they ultimately divorced in 1983. Dahl married Felicity Ann Crossland after that, and she was his wife until he died from leukemia at age 74 in 1990. And in those biographical details, there's again that sort of uh, the the duality. You know, Dahl worked closely with medical professionals. You know, there's also a story about how he helped design a valve that's used in heart surgeries. Oh, because yeah. Because one of his children had heart problems. Okay. Right. But also, he was uh, a difficult person to be around mm-hmm. and, you know, berated his wife while she was recovering from a stroke in order to enact some kind of tough love. Mm -hmm. And then also, yeah, he divorced uh, Patricia Neal in 1983. He married Felicity Ann Crossland, who it turned out he'd been having a long-term affair with. Yeah, and so let's keep this in mind. When this book was written, it was after Neal's series of strokes. I don't know where it lands in terms of her 
regaining the ability to move and speak. But clearly there was tension between the two of them in, in that family as he was yeah. working on this book, uh, which leads us to the fact that he owned a place named Whitefield Cottage, but he called it Gypsy House. And the reason why is because he bought a gypsy caravan that he actually installed in the garden. This is coming out of the, the research here. Charlie has a, a great note in here, which is that we should acknowledge <laughs> the fact that the word gypsy is a slur and a stereotype. We're talking about Romani people here. So the, the proper way to refer to this is that Dahl acquired what is referred to as a traditional Romanical Vardo. Uh, a Vardo is one of these horse-drawn wagons. They're built by British Romani people and used as homes. Yeah. So in 1954, the year after he got married, he bought a house. He called the house Gypsy House because of this gypsy caravan. Um, and he lived there for the rest of his life. And the caravan becoming kind of a writing hut is now on display. Now, I'm not quite sure if the caravan became the writing hut or if it was for a while the thing in the garden that he used and then he built a hut. The story as it was told in the research was that the, the caravan was like a playhouse at first. Like he, they played with the kids in it. And I think as the kids got older, he turned it into his writing studio. And I think you're right though, in that like then, like that wasn't enough. And then he had like a hut made or something like that. Probably as the billions of dollars started rolling in from all these (laughs) books and movies, he was like, yeah, I don't need to be in this tiny little wagon anymore. Margaret Talbot says that Roald Dahl wrote in a tiny cottage at the end of a trellised pathway canopied with twisting linden trees. He called it the writing hut. And since Dahl was nearly six feet six, he must have inhabited it like a giant in an elf's house. So this is all important because in Danny Champion of the World, the main characters live in a caravan exactly like the one that was in his backyard. Yeah. A and, caravan behind a garage. Yeah, yeah. They basically like ran a gas station and lived in this caravan behind it. Now, Dahl's writing process is quite evident when you look at these preserved sort of the preserved writing hut or what was going on in the caravan. Um, I'm going to quote from Talbot some more. Dahl was a strangely sympathetic adult who shared a preoccupation with candy a clinical fascination with the body and a love of ingenious self-devised schemes. The adults who look into the hut are less impressed. Yeah. So for context in Talbot's piece, she goes on this tour of the, of the doll estate and she notices like the adults are not into it and the kids <laughs> are, love it. They love every second of it. The walls are lined with styrofoam stained sepia from cigarettes that he smoked in there. There's a grotty wing chair. Grotty is such a great word. Yeah. Uh, And wires for a jury rigged heating system dangled from the ceiling. If you look in the back of these most recent editions, the trade paperback editions of the Roald Dahl books, there's all these, um, you know, fun facts, fun stories. And they describe in detail just how like cooped up and weird and, (laughs) and ritualistic his writing process was, you know, mm. a space heater at his feet, a blanket wrapped around him, a, uh, a, uh, writing board that he quote unquote invented to make up for. Yeah. That's in desks. here too. Yeah. Apparently he didn't, he was unsatisfied with desk probably because of his size. Now here's the really good stuff on a side table. He also kept a jar containing gristly bits of his own spine which had been removed during an operation on his lower back. Next to that jar is a waxy looking knob that is Dahl's hip bone. And uh, now in the uh, sort of museum quality of the writing hut, his uh, titanium replacement has joined <laughs> the hip bone. In so the wait, jar. did they take the titanium replacement off of his corpse before they buried him? <laughs> that's what, that's what this text implies. Yeah, to me. that's wild. Maybe he uh, had another titanium replacement. Maybe this is the first of, of many. Okay. But it would totally be appropriate to think that, you know, before yeah. they cremated him or after they cremated him, they took that out and yeah, sent it back. Look, look at this. It's left over. 
Uh, several young visitors asked for permission to hold the ball of chocolate bar wrappers that Dahl made as a young man. He scrunched a new one into the ball each day after eating his habitual lunchtime treat. Now hard and surprisingly heavy, the wad resembles a small cannonball. That sounds so nasty, but kind of cool. <laughs> yeah. Like as a kid, I'm like, oh, that's kind of cool, but I bet it's filthy. Um, it's just a bizarre setting for anybody to write in, much less someone who wrote all of these delightful kids books. So one of the things I learned in the research is that apparently this was originally written as a short story that appeared in the New Yorker. And then I think he took that short story and extrapolated it out into this children's book. Yeah. Cause there's several different threads in the novel. So there used to yeah. be a time where you could pick up the New Yorker and read like a young adult story about stealing pheasants from the rich. Yeah, I bet you it was less young adult when it was in the New Yorker. <laughs> they they were like making out in the forest right before they hypnotically uh you're such a horrible stole person. The pheasants. Uh Danny the Champion of the World was partially inspired by the Buckinghamshire countryside where Roald Dahl lived. Um the filling station, the garage that uh Danny and his dad run is based on the, quote, now abandoned red pump garage on Great Missenden High Street. So this is a very regional book. Dahl is writing the world that he was living in. Mm -hmm. uh, we mentioned that the Vardo uh, was a real thing in the backyard of the Dahl house. Um, and the book is dedicated to everyone in his family. Patricia Neal and then four children at the time, Tessa, Theo, Ophelia, and Lucy. All right. I have a question that I don't know the answer to. And I, I did not find in the bio about him. So I'm curious if you know it. He, we know he had five children. So at the time that he wrote this, he only had four. And we know that he had this like pretty terrible marriage to Patricia Neal in which she was like partially paralyzed. Did he have a fifth child with her or in old age with his second wife? Uh, well, unfortunately, uh, one of his children died very young of measles. measles. And that is the okay. fifth child who is missing from that set of four. Okay. Okay. Jeez. This is a, I mean, I can see now why they're making a biopic about this, you know, like it's hard. Yeah. I mean, this, there's nothing utopian about this writer, despite the sort of magical worlds that a lot of people feel like they inhabit. But you mm -hmm. know, the thing with doll is always that you just scratch the surface of any of these stories and you get this like dark, pessimist, almost nasty vision. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. um, now you mentioned uh, that there's sort of a shared universe yeah. quality to this book that is uh, overstating it a little bit. But there's a um, dark tower that everything yeah. spins around. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, what to, uh, to the tower uh, child Danny came. Is that how that goes? Sure. Yeah. I think it would be child rolled. Oh, very good. Uh, so the character of Danny's dad has was rendered before this novel. You know, this sort of astonishing, um, wondrous loving father who also has a streak of something in him. Um, but he had a different name the first time he appeared and the, uh, BFG, as you said, is a created story by the dad and Danny, the champion of the world. And this, you know, the, the rough draft of that book or not rough draft, but the rough draft of that idea is very clear in Danny, the champion of the world and becomes a much longer, much grosser novel 20 years later. No, uh, 15 years later. And so it's important to note here that Dahl wasn't alone in the creation of this book. It was illustrated by two people. The original illustrator's name is Jill Bennett, and she is the illustrator of over 50 children's books, including this and Dahl's Fantastic Mr. Fox and other books. Uh, she is currently in her 80s and lives in Bath, Somerset. Um... Now, this is interesting. Her collaboration with Dahl, though, came to an end because he changed publishers after 
in his view, a muddle occurred over the contract for this book, Danny Champion of the World. And as was mentioned in one of those articles, uh, you know, a person who was horrible to his publishers, right, is one of the stories about him. So, you know, a difficult uh, artist to deal with. So the version that most people see now is drawn by Quentin Blake. He is the current illustrator. And in fact, so he was who uh, Dahl went on to work with. And then after Dahl passed away, Blake went back and redrew some of his books, including this one. Now, I have to just say here and now, this is a totally subjective moment. This is Charlie biography. I really dislike the Quentin Blake illustrations because the ones that I saw when I was young and reading these for the first time yeah. were the Jill Bennett oh, illustrations. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And I feel a sense of loss that the additions you can get now are all Quentin Blake illustrations. Mm-hmm. And it's hard to be in that position because so much is made of Blake's yeah. relationship artistically with Roald Dahl and also about how much better or how much more intriguing those drawings are we've got some information on that here yeah i think the general consensus is that blake's style fits doll's imagination better than bennett's did um but i saw i saw one or two of bennett's drawings and i i too thought huh this seems actually more fitting to me and they were more colorful well i also read this on kindle are blake's drawings colored um, gosh, I don't know. They were all black and white in the one that we read. Okay. So on my Kindle, obviously they're black and white, but I was kind of assuming that he just used pen and wash. Um, so Quentin Blake, uh, we have a little bit of information about him from this Margaret Talbot piece, which honestly was very illuminating, um, and is, uh, linked to or cited on our landing page at supercontextpodcast.libson.com. Talbot says... The violent subtext of Dahl's books was leavened by the delightful illustrations of Blake. They began working together in the 1970s. Blake has this like loose, sketchy style. It it really just looks like he kind of bangs stuff out with a pen very quickly and then slaps a little bit of wash on it. Talbot also says that Blake was sometimes unnerved by how savage and scary Dahl's stories were, Uh, but he eventually came to appreciate him. And long story short, he was he was really pleased with how Blake drew uh, Matilda from the the infamous doll yeah. story, uh, and that's how he selected him. Talbot says that what Dahl and Blake were trying to do were to describe not self inflicted horrors, but those that were dealt out to children by adults, and this is like the big theme of this episode, I think, which is that um, adults are scary and uh, children are kind of on their own in a lot of situations. In a lot of ways, uh, as children, we are sometimes more uh, in tune with our common sense than adults might be. And Dahl is very particular about um, pointing out that if you're a kid always looking up at adults, Mm -hmm. that there's nothing flattering about someone's face from below. And, you know, that sort of weird grotesqueries or or deformities of that vision can make adults seem even more monstrous than maybe their actions do. So there's apparently a book, one of probably many, as a biography of Roald Dahl by Donald Sturrock. And he says in that book that Blake was able to almost intuit what Dahl's characters would look like, quote, Quentin began to realize just how precisely Roald imagined his stories. Initially, Dahl had described his character wearing a black hat, an apron, and large boots. But when Roald saw Quentin's drawing, he knew at once, and the giant needed to look softer and more lovable. He's referring there to the BFG. Yeah, so it got to the point where uh, Blake was actually giving Dahl ideas of how to do his stories Mm -hmm. and drawing in the midst of the drafting, right? cool that sounds like comics yeah totally um it's also it's weird there's uh jill bennett's style is very um sort of elegant and blake's style being all sort of spiky and and weird allowed him to do things like 
make a magnifying glass that highlights some detail from uh, the description of, say, a uh, a bit of food caught in Mr. Twit's beard. Mm. We're just sort of casually referencing all of these stories. Uh, there is no need <laughs> to feel lost if you don't know the details of all these stories. Um, Dahl wrote stuff about adults either dying and abandoning children or being awful to them in their guardianship. And the kids were saved by magic, outside kindness, or their own cunning. Mm. So there's an interesting little story here about Dahl and Blake and their relationship and how they work together with publishers. Apparently when they were working on the book, the BFG, Dahl found out that Blake had only submitted 12 illustrations for the book. But then he found out the whole thing was because the publisher was only willing to pay him 300 pounds for illustrating the entire book. And he was like, this is ludicrous. Of course, he only gave you 12 pictures. He said, quote, this is cheese pairing to the ultimate degree. It is an <laughs> insult to my book. So Blake was subsequently offered a better deal. He started all over again, and he wrote an illustration for every 24 chapters in that book. Uh, but all of this was pulled at the last minute. So despite the setbacks, there was this advantage that the pair were able to look at the book anew, and they had this relationship that crystallized during the work on that on the BFG. And this, I think, is what led to them working together on more stuff and then Blake going back and kind of becoming synonymous with Dahl's work. Mm -hmm. um, there's even the detail of the titles of uh, Dahl books now are Quentin Blake's handwriting, sort of a, a scrawl. And Quentin Blake told Sturrock that we've been quoting, my belief is that if you collaborate with the book with the words, then you collaborate with the author. Okay. So, so in a lot of ways, this book is also by Quentin Blake. I mean, you could read this and not see the illustrations and it would be fine. But it, I mean, even on a Kindle for me, it was quintessentially part of the reading experience. Yeah, and retroactively too. Because this one, Danny the Champion of the World, is the last one that Dahl did with Jill Bennett. Mm. So now the edition you see, you know, here's the thing. Like, I remember very clearly an image of Danny's dad walking with his cast drawn by Jill Bennett. Okay. Burned yeah. into my brain. And of course, Blake doesn't draw it anything like that. And so there was reading this book. The one bit of tension I felt was that's not the right picture. Oh, that's not the right picture. You sound like a comics fanboy. It's like, it's like when a comics fan goes and sees a Marvel movie and they're like, wait a minute, that's not what Thor's hammer looks like. You're right, Chris. That's exactly what it's like. So I have another mystery that you might be able to solve for us here. Recall that uh, apparently Bennett's working relationship with Dahl stopped after a disagreement over how this book was handled by the publisher. What we don't know from that quote is which publisher it was. I've got a list here of three publishers that have worked on this book. One of them is the American publisher. One of them is the British publisher. And then one of them is the current British publisher. So the first is Alfred A. Knopf Incorporated. They're an American publishing house that was founded in 1915. They were acquired by Random House in 1960. And then Random House was subsequently acquired by Bertelsmann in 1998. It's the grand super context story of every time we do a book that <laughs> everything is owned by the big five in publishing. Um, Alfred A. Knopf distinguishes itself within that big umbrella corporation by being known for paying close attention to design and typography. A lot of Chip Kids books were for Alfred Knopf. So the original publisher um, who did the edition that I remember, whose illustrations, uh, which uh, has the illustrations of Jill Bennett, mm -hmm. was Jonathan Cape. Okay, so that's our next one. This, that makes sense. That's probably why Puffin now has it. Okay, yeah. so Jonathan Cape was a London publishing firm, or it still is. They were founded in 1921. Hey, guess who owns them? Um, one of the five. The same one that owns Alfred A. <laughs> Knopf, Random House. 
Hey, is that snake eating its own tail? So this is kind of hilarious, right? Because he, it was like, I don't want to work with them anymore. And then an umbrella corporation just scoops them up along with. After he died. Uh, No, he died three years after this happened. Uh, I thought it was 98. He died. uh, This says they were bought out in 1987. He died in 90. Oh, okay. So, okay. Jonathan Cape, apparently they had to perform this like crazy defensive merger with these companies. I don't even know how to pronounce Chato and Windus. Um, (laughs) They were apparently two other presses that were then added to the Jonathan Cape group. And so this came a couple years before Jonathan Cape published the British edition of Danny Champion of the World. Now, they're known for a, quote, fine list of English language authors, including Robert Frost. I want Frost, you to remember immediately that we have a number of UK listeners who like us very much and are about to hate us if you keep up with that fucking voice. Including Robert Frost, Ian Fleming, James Joyce, T.E. Lawrence... J.G. Ballard, Salman Rushdie, and Roald Dahl. One of these things is not like the other, for sure. I know. What the hell is Ian Fleming doing on that That, list? that is a weird... He is also weird. You're right. He's an outlier. But it's... Um, in fact, I think uh, Jonathan Cape might have been the publisher for the Ballard book that we covered as well, Charlie. I think uh, yeah. I remember them being them coming up in that episode, too. At least one of the publishers. So Right. So apparently Cape is the publishing house that he had this fallout with, and they were the ones who hired Bennett. So now in, I guess in just the UK, maybe in Europe as well, Puffin Books handles the distribution. Do you know who owns Puffin Books, Charlie? Uh, is it Random House? Yeah, Random House. All of these and companies are owned Random by house? the same company now. Bertelsmann and Pearson. Right. Okay. <laughs> So it's every everything is owned by this one mega corporation now. Like you know, forty years later, it's like none of the decisions he made to move it to different publishers mattered. So this is a perfect moment. This five corporations moment mm. is uh, the time to talk about the story of this book. Normally, we don't do very much content analysis. Analysis, in fact, sometimes we just breeze right by what actually happens in these narratives that we're talking about. Yeah. But we need to lay this down now because there are some important things to talk about in terms of themes. Okay. So Danny is a young boy who has a uh, almost insulated relationship with his dad, who he loves dearly and who loves him dearly back. Um, Danny's mom died long before we enter the story. We find out that Danny's dad is a poacher. And that his dad was a poacher and his dad was a poacher. And in fact, poaching the pheasants from the rich man's wood is kind of the pastime of most of the town. Yeah. Like everybody in the town from the the clergy to the cops, to the local doctor are all pheasant poachers. Yeah. Some very casual. So the taxi driver too. Very rigorous. Mm -hmm. Um, But when he was raising Danny, Danny's dad kept it together and did not go out poaching. And then Danny gets old enough that his dad feels comfortable going to poach. And off he goes. And Danny wakes up in the middle of the night and finds that his father's gone. And when his dad gets back, the whole story comes out. I couldn't, I, I went to poach. I love doing it. He tells all these stories about how great it is to eat pheasant, especially pheasant that you've stolen And they come to an agreement that Danny's dad can go poach sometimes. He'll let Danny know he's doing it, and they'll keep it as just an occasional hobby. Then one night, Danny's dad breaks his leg in a trap set by the woods watchmen, you know, the people protecting the pheasants. Danny has The rich guy is so rich that he hires people to solely just hang out in the woods and watch over the pheasants with shotguns. The keepers, right? Yeah. Who have no problem putting some uh, bird shot in a poacher's ass. Yeah. That's something else I think we need to come back to, but continue. (laughs) And, uh, Danny ends up having to drive a car at age, what? Nine. Yeah. I think something like that. Track down his dad, get him out of the hole. And Danny in that moment, realizing that, uh, you know, Mr. Victor Hazel, 
the owner of the woods and the keepers are playing so mean. Danny's in it and they come up with a extraordinary plan to poach the whole woods. And I don't want to ruin any more of this book for anybody. Well, there's one really important thing that I feel like yeah. you're leaving out though, which is that this is a story about class war and that Danny and his father are extremely poor. Yes. They run a gas station. They're the town's mechanics. Um, but they live in a wagon behind the gas station and uh, they basically eat baked beans every night. They, they only have, you know, one fork for each person. They live a very simple, humble life. Um, and they are socially friendly with everybody in the town except for Mr. Hazel, who is this fabulously wealthy, what we would now call one percenter, who uh, is rude to everybody in the town and mean to children and kicks dogs. Uh, and it, it, it sets up a very strong distinction between classes. There's even that little thing about how Mr. Hazel wanted respect because of his money. Yeah. And thought he should get it and never could. And something that's implicit in the book is that Danny's father is very resentful that he's poor and Mr. Hazel is rich and that there are things that they don't have that he wishes they could have. And he sees Mr. Hazel being horrible all the time. Um, you and I have spent many an episode talking about how when we were kids villains used to look like the current president of the United States looks like. And it, that's why it makes so little sense to us, right? Like how did this guy get, get to where he is? He, we were taught that this is what the bad guy looks like. Yeah. He's the first villain in a bond movie <laughs> who, who goes down hard in the middle. And then we find out about the real villain. Yeah. Right. Uh, and Mr. Hazel is through and through one of those types of characters. He's, He's the, you know, incredibly rich, rude, dishonorable man uh, that is really just kind of, you know, the example of like who you don't want to grow up to be. Yeah. So fuck that guy. Let's take a break. Charlie, I hope that our uh, Patreon listeners don't ever feel the way that Roald Dahl's editors at mm. Alfred E. Knopf felt about him. I don't. I, I hope they don't feel like we're abusing them or belittling them. Uh, I hope they feel like they're a part of our community and that they have helped create and transform the show because they have. I hope that they feel like uh, we are Roald Dahl and his publishers and they are reading the wonderful books that make them happy while you and I are shitty to each other. <laughs> Very nice. <laughs> Well, either way, our Patreon support helps us do things like pay for hosting fees, cover our expenses for media artifacts that are researched in every episode, and update our recording setup for better production. We're looking ahead and hoping to expand support and do things like get transcripts made, create an internship, and even pay for travel to record in person. Charlie came up with an amazing idea. I would like us to record an episode in a caravan behind Roald Dahl's house. But what that also means is that you get rewards as a patron. And those rewards include things like access to outtakes and blooper reels, bi-weekly bonus mini episodes, and a monthly Super King Context episode, which is an entire shadow podcast that we do only about Stephen King adaptations. You could also choose topics ask us questions to answer in many episodes or sponsor a live ad read on the show. We appreciate all of our Patreon supporters and we like to give them stuff back and we can be very goofy on those mini episodes. Something that everyone gets unless they say, no, please don't do that is a thank you for being a Patreon supporter. And we do that right here. And now let us thank our newest patron, Phil, no last name. Thank you also to Alex Laird, Ambrose Allen, Amit Doshi, Bennett Callahan, Beth Barnett, Billy Whitehouse, Brian Chovenich, and Caroline Zoids. Oh, you hit that kind of hard. I uh, think I've been pronouncing it wrong for the last month or two. Okay. 
thank you also to Chris Marlton, Cliff Landis. I, I have to stop for a moment. When has mispronouncing a name ever given you a moment of unrest? Uh, let's see. Uh, it's going to come up in about 17 more names. <laughs> Thank you to Chris Marlton, Cliff Landis, Coco, Dave Jordan, Dave Wachter, Eilish Phillips, Evan Mapstone, Fred Rasco, Ira J- 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 James Udiskin, Jason Puckett, and Jess Staten. Thank you to Jill Kaufman, Joseph Aleo, Junta Slash Cult, Calvin Ellis, Carmela Padovich, Kate Sharon, Kevin Wetter, Christian Hirvilla, right there, Charlie. You did it, yeah. Very Lee nice. Fowler, Liliana Gill, Lokesh Dakar, and Luigi Oswego. Thank you to Melinda Hale, Miriam Meany, Misha Moon, Nathan Weatherford, Neil G. McGuire, Nick Sage, Patrick Malka, Pete Bow, R.M. Rhodes, and the podcast Rain It In, Matt and Rachel. Thank you to Rob Sloan, Robert Negoesco, Roman Marachek, Ron Bilodeau, Ross Llewellyn, Ryan O'Neill, Sari Nichols, Simon Workman, Thomas Tremberger, and Whitney Buchanan. We would love to have you as a Patreon supporter. Check out what you can do for us and what we can do for you at patreon.com slash supercontext. And we're back. So let's talk about like how this has been received. Uh, like I said, this is a story I hadn't heard of before. It's not one of the ones that's known for having a movie adaptation, although it turns out it did have one. Uh, So this story hasn't really been awarded, uh, but Dahl has. Dahl is known for his contributions to literature. He has the 1983 World Fantasy Award for Lifetime Achievement, the British Book Award for Children's Author of the Year. That was the year he died. In 2008, uh, The Times placed him as number 16, on its list of the 50 greatest British writers since 1945. This book, the only award I could find for it was that Time Magazine put it on its 100 best YA books of all time list. All right. And that's not even an award so much as an accolade. Yeah. Dahl's work is kind of monolithic Mm. with these little protrusions into pop culture, like the chocolate factory and the witches. Um, now, it did have that movie adaptation. Did you track that down? I did not. So in I 1989, did. it's a TV movie, but it sounds fucking nuts because Jeremy Irons plays the dad. And uh, Do you know who plays uh, Jeremy Irons' son? No, who? Christian Jeremy Bale? Irons' son. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. Who did not continue acting after that. Yeah. And well. Mr. Victor Hazel? Mm-hmm. Robbie Coltrane. Oh, that's cool. That's yeah. a good cast. Yeah. Okay. I could totally see that. It's very weird to see the adaptation because it's it's obviously on purpose, mm-hmm. but the way that the the movie depicts this world doesn't concentrate on any of the things that I concentrated on. You know, like the focus, the things that are important to foreground don't feel like the book I read, even though the story is pretty straightforward. What's in the book? Well, they apparently they set the film in 1955, even yeah, though the book was old, originally yeah. set in the seventies. So I think this is another one of those versions of like boomers remembering the fifties as being this like fantastic magical time. <laughs> and so they, for some reason changed the setting of the story to fit that dream version it's also awesome to see Jeremy Irons playing this ultra loving, calm, you know, forgiving father. Mm. Yeah, knowing that's unusual. what he is and what he has become. <laughs> um, if you go to rolldoll.com, I didn't realize this. The, there's this whole like cottage industry that's built around his book. So apparently like selling 250 million books wasn't enough for the doll estate. You know, there's um, at the end of each of the new editions of the books, there's like five or six pages of back matter uh-huh. talking about rolldoll.com and sending you to the various places yeah. and kind of establishing its uh, its place in your life. You know, you don't quite sign up for Roll Doll Plus, but it's getting there. Yeah, it's close. So there's, yeah, uh, you can buy, for instance, limited edition prints from the art that's in the book. And these aren't cheap. They're like $75, $100 prints of the Blake art. Or uh, they have lesson plans that you can purchase for 
you know, school programs, stuff like that. Uh, clearly, like, they're continuing to sell these books, but they're also building a, a, another industry around them. So it's not just a reading experience anymore. It's a world experience. Right. Yeah. And given the way that you've described it, it makes sense. I could totally see you being like, oh, yeah, maybe I will spend $75 on that print because then like me and the kids can look at that and we can talk about, you know, Charlie or William or Danny or whatever. And that'll be like a thing we can remember together. Yeah. It would be very hard for me to turn down a print of the original cover. You know, that would be something I would put up on a wall. Mm -hmm. Um, okay. There's a lot of love and, and, uh, sort of, um, inclusiveness in that idea, rolldoll.com. But we do have to mention that this book is pretty white bread. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, it doesn't really include many characters that aren't male, straight and white. Although some, some of their sexualities aren't described at all. Uh, but it's mostly about class distinction. So like I was saying earlier, like, I think the way that it's representing different types of people is, well, it's very white English. It's very <laughs> Anglo in that it's more about class than it is about ethnicity or, or gender. Yeah. Uh, I think the only female character shows up at the end and is pushing a baby carriage. Yes, with a surprise inside. I feel like I can't speak with any authority as to what the the makeup of the Birmingham Shire area was at the time that he was writing this. Yeah, me either. I have the sense that that is one of those places that had the monoculture going yeah, in the 60s. Yeah, I mean, it seems like it, um, but also like that's how it's represented to us in pop culture, so it's hard to tell. Yeah. Uh, and there's this weird thing about doll books. Like, um, it's hard to tell where the chocolate factory is. Hmm. It could be America and it could be England. It's a small town. There's mountains and forests around it. It never quite makes sense. All of the characters are fairly English, except what does that mean? You know? And it, it's just kind of this weird nowhere. Hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. I never thought about that before. I guess I always just... Well, again, because I never read the books. I yeah. only saw the movie version, so I assumed they were American. I am very happy that Roald Dahl did not uh, engage ethnicity um, as part of his... Uh, well, given what we've learned about his anti-Semitism, yeah. yeah, I think that's probably the safe bet. I will say this, like... There's all these descriptions of him being kind of like a horrible, nasty man with a little bit of a, of a racist streak and sexist streak. A lot streak. of a racist streak. And yet he seems conscious enough to know not to include any of that in the content of his books. So there's something like despite the fact that those were maybe his everyday beliefs, he knew that they weren't acceptable. It's obvious that he knows that this is for a mass market. So in these stories, like one could make the argument, well, well, they never described the ethnicity of, of such and such characters. So, you know, you don't know if there are people who right. are white. You can this. imagine them however you want, except these books are filled with illustrations. Well, yeah. Yeah. So it's weird kind of a mission that leads to like what you referred to earlier, monoculture, just the assumption yeah. like, well, yeah, everybody's like us until they're not. Now, the reason that I bring that up right now is, you know, thinking about representation, but also thinking again about what my experience was of approaching this book with a little timidity, knowing as an adult that Dahl has said shit like, there's a trait in the Jewish character that does provoke animosity. I mean, there's always a reason why anti anything crops up anywhere, even a stinker like Hitler didn't just pick on them for no reason. Holy fuck. Right. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. uh, and yet it doesn't seem to exist in the book. And part of the reason it doesn't exist in the book is because there's no real engagement with those ideas in the books. Right. He, yeah. he doesn't present anything. That's there's no racist acknowledgement of Jewish culture because, or ethnicity. Yeah, Cause yeah. there's no acknowledgement of race. Mm -hmm. It's this kind of, um, 
uh, insulated uh, a blank almost. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. so I also feel pretty comfortable reading a story like this to my daughter, knowing that we make a point to engage ideas of race and other cultures generally. Yeah. And so what this does engage is this idea, which I think you and I probably grew up with to a certain extent, which is like, oh, well, you know, you can't possibly be racist if you don't see color, right? Like there's no, (laughs) if you don't acknowledge that people are different, then there's no racism. We're all the same here. Yeah. Yeah. Now, what he does engage with in this book, which was extraordinary to me when I did read it and sparked more than a few conversations with my daughter is class resentment and and the violence authoritarian violence you know state sponsored violence essentially there's some weird stuff in this man that i would think would be real tough to explain to a kid like why it's okay to steal from people yeah and why it's okay to hit students across the face uh i think it's just on the hand in this isn't it is it okay yeah it's they, the ruler they on the use hand. the mm-hmm, yeah Oh, so yeah, that's okay then. That's okay. Hey, I got hit on the hand <laughs> and on the ass. It Let's wasn't okay about, then either. Yeah, no, it's not. It's never been okay. Let's talk about what Mary Ness uh, wrote in Tor about this book. Uh, so in larger context, she says, Behind that is another darker story of class resentment and fury. Danny's father is a highly intelligent man who has memorized extensive information about animals and birds We don't know why, but something stopped him from getting a further education, a higher education. Yeah, there's a whole section where Danny says, like, if my father were able to, he would have been able to, you know, be some, like, fantastic naturalist or something like that. Yeah. The magic of this book, and by that I mean the thing that is almost unreal, is how much, how compartmentalized Danny's dad's anger is how compartmentalized his resentment is Mm -hmm. and how he does not infect his son at all with any of the things that he wishes were different. His regrets are almost completely smoothed over by the life he makes with his son. Interesting. Okay. Um, let's, let's keep that in mind as we go on. Cause I, I don't know if I agree with that. I, I definitely felt like there were there was like a tension throughout the book that got greater as we as you got closer to the end of Danny being like, wait a minute, is my father a bad person? And then he'd be like, no, I love my father. How could he possibly be a bad person? Wow, my father and the clergy and the doctor and the cop are all doing this thing that I've been told is a bad thing. You're totally right that there is that that kind of, is my dad breaking the law? Is it all right to break the law? But Danny's dad is not making a hostile environment because of what he's dealing with. And he's obviously dealing with a lot because he's a very poor man Mm -hmm. who doesn't seem to have been given opportunities that he would have been able to handle, who lost his wife and who is uh, harassed by the rich man down the road long before any of this poaching thing happens. Well, there's supposed to be a long history of it between the families, but yeah. I, I would also say that uh, Danny's dad kind of goes breaking bad at a point in this book where he's there's like that one moment. Yeah. He's like reckless. And he's like, the kid is continually being like, am I safe? Am I safe? I don't feel safe right now, but my dad keeps telling me I'm safe. And that is like a huge red flag. <laughs> yes, Absolutely in the story, but the life that they've, you know, in the narrative of the book, but the life that they've built is almost idyllic up until we start dealing with the events of the novel. I, I don't agree. I, I, I wow. think that you're, wow. okay. you're, you've got like a real romanticized version of this. Yeah. Huh. You're, I think your love for this book and the experience of this book is uh, romanticizing that, but I can see why. Yeah. But I I think that you're actually adding some of your own experiences to the qualities of what is uh, presented by doll. Yeah, it could be. Yeah. Well, let's continue on with the themes and see what other people have to say about it. So Victor Hazel roaring snob. Um, 
we've sort of detailed that the 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 villain of this story, the antagonist, is the worst that there could be. Yeah, he's not actually murdering the poor, but he's doing everything but. Yeah. So like, as we learn, like he's a jerk to the doctor. He kicks the doctor's dog. Uh, he's mean to all the other residents. I think he uh, he doesn't hit Danny, but he like chastises him for something. And then the father he gets really ang- yeah. yeah, the father gets really angry. There's a point where the father, this is another part where I was like, whoa, the father is going off the rails here where he just like rants and raves in the wagon about how he's going to go beat the shit out of Hazel. Uh, mm-hmm. Oh, no, not Hazel. Sorry. The teacher. It's the teacher. Yeah. yeah. Uh, because the teacher wraps him on the hand with the stick. Um, and that is a moment, too, where I was like, is Roald Dahl... Like, is he writing about his own experience as a parent with something like this? Or is he writing a character that is clearly unhinged because he doesn't have a partner there to kind of help calm him down and help him uh, ease the burden of parenting? Yeah, I mean, there's no way to tell because Danny, he writes from Danny's point of view. Yeah. It's a first person book. And so Dahl allows Danny to be confused by things. And we as the reader have to pick up on what the adult subtext is. We should also talk about the pheasant thing here for a second, because I think there's a, this book sort of assumes that you understand this culture and it's a, it's a very, uh, (laughs) I think like upper class British thing. The idea that you're so rich that you buy the game that you will hunt and you keep them on your land year round so they're just kind of docile and you can go out there anytime you want with your friends and shoot them as if you're like actually hunting. Yeah. And you make a big deal out of it and have a party around yeah. The shooting. Yeah. Uh, this sounds like I, I can't remember if they were on such a, a state or not, but this sounds like the infamous story of Dick Cheney shooting his friend in the face. That's totally what I kept thinking. Yeah, yeah. me too. So uh, I, I, I can't remember if that was actually that type of place or not, but these things do exist it's a corruption of the uh the original action of hunting you right. know for your dinner it's yeah, uh, ted nugent would not approve of this kind of hunting it's a it's a um conglom- it's an amalgamation <laughs> of capital in the form of birds yeah right <laughs> um and so there's also an interesting thing that goes on here thematically and, and it's interesting to think about Danny Champion of the World in retrospect of this. Dahl's young protagonists are usually orphans. Uh, and he often shows either family solidarity or love that's powerful enough to help these kids get through whatever adventures they're on, right? So think of Charlie and his, it's his grandfather, right? In the, yeah, even though his parents are not dead, he's not yeah. orphaned, they don't go with him on the trip. Yeah. It's his grandfather who leaps out of bed to join the uh, chocolate factory adventure. And then this is where some of the uh, people start complaining where they say like, Oh, well the children don't respect the adults enough and they depict too much cruelty and crude humor. uh, And that subsequently, like they think is going to lead children who read these books to, I don't know, talk back or treat their elders with disrespect. And this goes back to what you were saying. So Danny starts to question whether his dad's God, right? You know, mm-hmm. Whether his father is this perfect man. Because not only does he find out about the poaching, he also finds out that his dad has this wicked temper. Because yeah, whatever right. happened before, the moment where Danny says to his dad, I was punished, you know, corporally at school. Mm-hmm. Danny's dad gets nutsy mm-hmm. and says, I'll kill him. All of this against the backdrop of the revelation of poaching and the kind of uh, maniacal sort of, we're going to do this huge plan. We're going to yeah. poach all the pheasants in one night. And Danny is the one who can uh, formulate, formulate a plan under duress and make it happen. Who can be the cool head of reason mm. when he is being literally, as you pointed out off air, literally endangering his child. Yeah, it's a good thing that Dahl ended the story when he did, because I feel like if if it kept going, like if there were a sequel, I don't want to know what the revelations are going to be about what other secrets Danny's father has, you know, like (laughs) what he'd been doing in the garage after midnight or it's just it sounds like this guy has got a real uh, (laughs) 
a real Mr. Hyde persona that he's been tamping down for nine years. See, this is you are leaning into the uh, the darkness of adults that Dahl appears to present and that a lot of people have trouble with. Well, I mean, I would say that as bad as the villain is in this, the way that the father is seen as being he's deified is chiseled away throughout the story. I think this is both a story of a a family that has great affection for each other and of a young boy realizing that his father isn't perfect. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Isn't perfect is different than, you know, I don't know, killing animals in the garage at night, which I think is what you are implying. That's my version. Yeah. (laughs) Dahl has a weird kind of moralism. Um, a lot of people get their comeuppance, you know, if they are selfish, if they are, um, silly, if they're neglectful, if they are prideful, Mm -hmm. sometimes that comeuppance is death and, and vicious, you know, but then sometimes that comeuppance is just humiliation. Yeah. This, this is actually another good point here. So there's, there's two things about this book that uh, steer away from murder happening or, or just any kind of killing. Uh, you mentioned the shotguns earlier. Yep. They're, they're not filled with actual bullets. They use like, what is it? Bird shot? Like, yeah, it's, it's one up from rock salt. Yeah. So know? every time these folks get shot when they're stealing the pheasants, they just get like splinters in their butt, basically little metal pellets, splinters pellets, that have yeah. to be pulled out. And, they're not killed outright. Uh, and that struck me as odd. And then the whole story is about this sport in which you hunt and kill these birds and then eat them. And <laughs> and at the end, there's sort of, I don't want to spoil the ending, but there's sort of this moment where you're like, oh, wow, they just murdered like 200 birds. And, <laughs> and then it is revealed that they did not. Right. But then you find out, oh, no, no, no. Some of the birds are totally dead. And they're so happy about it when they find these, the corpses of these birds. <laughs> this is, it's really macabre. Yeah. So it, whatever the version is of um, n- not yet understanding the, uh, you know, sort of the point of veganism or sustainability <laughs> or anything, like whatever that is, this is in the pre-woke oh, for in, sure. in terms of food culture. Yeah, no, <laughs> kind no, of no time. for sure. Yeah. No, the the value of the bird's life is not really thought of at all, except by the police officer, because the police officer is the one person who's like, well, you know, I think those birds would really hate it if they got shot. So we have to think about what they would be thinking of, which is to run away. (laughs) Uh, We have we have given the audience so little context. There might be someone who's read Danny, the champion of the world, and they're like, Oh, yes, that scene, that scene with the pheasants and the policeman. Oh, and by the way, the policeman is Chief O'Hara from the Batman 60s TV show, right? Yes. He's totally Chief O'Hara. Yeah. Uh, He's he's a a caricature. (laughs) That is the thing that happens in all of Dahl's books. Well, all of his kids' books is that the the bad guys, the bad people are um, caricatures. They're ugly they're fat. He really, this is that kind of, um, uh, nasty minded doll stuff where he really leans into how the bad people are ugly, you know, or overweight and uses that as a signal Mm that you should not find them, um, admirable at all. Yeah. That showed up, uh, not in the research, but a lot of the bios talked about, I, they didn't use the term fat shaming, but they talked about how that's like a common theme throughout his books. Oh yeah. And, no, is, he, and he, is frowned upon nowadays. Yeah. He makes, um, he makes, uh, obesity, a, uh, failure of character. But this really gets back to the broader theme, which is that, uh, adults are bad. <laughs> that children, <laughs> children kind of look up at adults and, and, more often than not, the the adults treat them poorly uh, and are are mean. Yeah. And even and then in this book, this book is kind of riding on this weird line because it's like even the adults that are friendly and helpful are like kind of crazy. Yeah. 
And Danny is the most uh, sensible and mature character. Yeah. Dahl presents children as sort of the the pinnacle of humanity mm-hmm. that can be corrupted by outside forces like being spoiled by their parents or gluttony or, um, you know, taking on bad habits. But you grow up from this good place into this maniacal place, this disciplinary, authoritarian, um, possibly violent, uh, rash and unthinking place. Mm. Which is where all these all these adults who are poachers who've been stealing from Victor Hazel. And in fact, Danny's dad, for the beginning of the book, has all of the kid qualities that we see in Danny. You know, yeah. he's talking about how mm-hmm. much he loves the world. He's he's kind. He's patient. He is. There is, in um, fact, very little that Danny's dad knows that he does not. Like his dad, his dad will occasionally be like, oh, you know, there's a river over there that's got some fish in it. We could go tickle them and take them. And Daniel will go, oh, that's great. <laughs> but then it'll like his dad's a mechanic and it's firmly established that Danny is as good of a mechanic as his father, if not better, and can like completely take apart an engine and fix it at age nine. Yeah. So then people feel like that is... Um... A corrupting influence to read doll books. Right. Yeah. So this is where it comes in that there's certain parents. Margaret Talbot talks about it this way, that doll is seen as a children's writer that some adults dislike and distrust, though they've not found it easy to say why. In a doll book, you're never out of earshot of a sly authorial voice that is sharing a secret joke about a character or is announcing that it's about to yank you out of a scene that's becoming a bit too gross or distressing. Adults' objections to Dahl have more to do with his sensibility. Yeah, Talbot is. Uh, she even compares him to Evelyn Waugh, and uh, and says that sort of the tradition of Roald Dahl is in Lemony Snicket. Oh, not in, yeah, not in other beloved children's authors now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it. But really, ultimately, like these books are about disdainful, neglectful, selfish parents and this book is is particularly weird because the father isn't disdainful but he is neglectful and selfish in a lot of ways and yet it's kind of at the end it's just like oh and everything was hunky-dory and perfect and we loved each other (laughs) well the poaching is kind of an addiction so this is the beginning of of yeah right you know addicted single parent Mm -hmm. Uh, um in 1995 this is talbot reporting on um one of these challenges in 1995, a mother attempting to expunge Dahl from elementary school libraries in Virginia told the Washington Post, this, I, for all I know, I knew this person, told the Washington Post that in his books, it was your mother. It's not my mom. She liked Dahl. Children misbehave and take retribution on adults, and there's never, ever a consequence for their actions. According to the surprisingly common critique of Dahl, Talbot says, to defy one adult, no matter how bad a person, is to defy us all. And how interesting that Talbot then sort of adds herself into that, like us all. Mm -hmm. We've got a few more of these sort of, um, why are these books bad for children? In 1972, uh, the Horn Book, a journal of children's literature, published uh, something by Eleanor Cameron, who is a children's book author herself, who says... Charlie and the Chocolate Factory was one of the most tasteless books ever written for children. It was not just about candy, but it was candy. Delectable and soothing while we are undergoing the brief sensory pleasure it affords, but leaves us poorly nourished with our taste dulled for better fare. Mm -hmm. And then finally, holy cow, Ursula K. Le Guin has something to say about Roald Dahl. Yeah, I thought this was particularly interesting. So she was... She kind of chimed in on like an earlier person's critique of Dahl. In fact, uh, it was Cameron who you were just referring to. But uh, yeah, Le Guin said uh, she admitted that uh, children between 8 and 11 seemed to be fascinated by Dahl's books. Indeed, one of her own children, she regretted to say, used to finish Charlie and then start right over again from the beginning. Sounds like 
the way you just described it. For sure. She was like one possessed while reading it. And for a while after reading, she was, for a usually amiable child, quite nasty. The books, Le Guin concluded, provide a genuine escape experience. A tiny psychological fugue, very like that, provided by comic books. Oh, that one gets us both, Chris. Damn, girl. (laughs) I think if Ursula Le Guin were still alive today, and also I imagine that quote is is quite dated, she would have a a very different uh, take on both comic books and children's stories like this. Doll is such an interesting character. We've already said this, but uh, it bears repeating. His books are beloved by many people, but they are also easy targets for people who think that they are presenting bad ideas in a um, eminently consumable way. In fact, in the 80s, The Witches, published in 1983, was criticized for being a misogynistic text. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, that's not all that surprising, is it? Well, the, the, the idea that the text is misogynistic is a little surprising, but the idea that Dahl was misogynistic is not surprising at all. Yeah. This is another moment where I wonder like your, your absolute joy and love for these books seems to be making it hard for you to process when other people are criticizing them, no matter who it is. I don't know. I think you don't see how the witches could be misogynistic. I think you're a quite prudish person and it's really bringing it out of you right now. You're like that woman in Virginia. Okay. Cool. Well, we'll let the audience decide. Then. <laughs> uh, but however, in 1985, a critic called The Witches, quote, this is a bit much, a dangerous publication which bore a striking similarity to the misogynistic 15th century witch hunting text, the Mal- <laughs> Malleus Maleficarum, which I am familiar with, which I believe translates to Hammer of Witches. <laughs> It's really bizarre to me that the, um, you know, all of these critiques don't really seem to uh, be borne out by the books themselves. I understand that I sound like uh, a a gleeful defender of everything dollish, but I don't remember them being packages of nastiness that got to me, you know, Mm -hmm. and I don't find them that way reading them now. And you don't but, trust all of these voices that are showing up in the, the research here. Well, I recognize that Dahl himself is exactly this. Yeah. Like he, he is a difficult person who certainly was not, uh, not the whimsical, uh, jolly person that some of those, um, some of those little details of his writing hut seem to imply. Mm hmm. You know, he was a a difficult person who was, as we've already said, anti-Semitic and appears to have been quite cruel to people in his life. But the books don't, the books don't seem to have that streak unless you're looking for them. That doesn't sound like a good defense at all. I mean, really? I'm, I'm sort of falling into a place now of being like, well, I, I've never felt that way before, so I don't know if I can believe it. I mean, I haven't read Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, but I've seen the movie like a gazillion times, so it might be a little different. But Willy Wonka's an asshole. Like, he's presented, at, at the end, you're supposed to be like, oh, this is so magical. You get to hang out with this magical dude and eat all this chocolate. But he's a jerk. He's horrible <laughs> to everybody, both in the movie, the for good sure. protagonist yeah. and the the you know uh, spoiled children, um, and that's part of what makes it so much fun as an adult now is to go back and look at the you know Gene Wilder going like I say good day to you, sir. That stuff. Yeah. But yeah. like, he's yeah no I I don't it's it's kind of eerie to me to watch you try to come up with all of these justifications for it justifications for what you saw in a movie adaptation of a book i read this book there's a lot of stuff in this book that's weird man and you're very much just kind of smiling it off and being like no 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 it's okay because i love it and i'm having a good experience with my kid wow okay um let's continue into this uh very particular anti-dollism that you found 
uh, there was a 1994 unauthorized biography by someone named Jeremy Treglown. Treglown. Yeah, so this is at least the second biography we've heard about in this episode. Treglown apparently, that's an unfortunate name, uh, <laughs> presents <laughs> Dahl as a complicant, complicated, domineering, and sometimes dis- difficult man. This is where we get to the Patricia Neal stuff. Uh, so yes, he was a war hero, a connoisseur, and a philanthropist. He was a devoted family man. He confronted a appalling succession of tragedies in his life, but he was also a fantasist, an anti-Semite, a bully, and a self-publicizing troublemaker. Here's the like details about the Patricia Neal stuff, which I suspect the biopic we were talking about will will highlight. Uh, she suffered this stroke that we mentioned. She was 39 when it happened, and he adopted a, quote, cruel-to-be-kind strategy in which he bullied, goaded, and sometimes humiliated her into acting again. He was prone to eruptions of pick. That is a <laughs> very weird that's, way that's to a put very, it. That's a very sort of uh, um, understated elegance Yeah, uh, to say someone who had a temper. His editorial director at Knopf, again, the American publisher of this book, uh, severed ties with Dahl and said the reason why was because he was abusive to his staff. More than once. Oh, this is where uh, then, you yeah, came I, up with I that. I read this already. Mm-hmm. But I, I, this this is incredibly striking to me to discover that the guy who wrote these books that I loved was one of those assholes who says... Well, the Jews must have done something to deserve what they got. It's insane. Is it, though? Because, you know, building up to this, we've been talking about doing this episode for a couple months. And every time it's come up, you've said, look, I know he's an anti-Semite. Like, I, I won't be surprised by that. So don't worry. Like, No, no. In my life when this was revealed. Oh, you mean I'm when saying, you found out earlier? Yeah, yeah. Because okay. this was fairly recent. I mean... What I was saying to you was, hey, when you do the, the research for this, mm. you will find out that Dahl was a shitbag. I know, and it won't be a horrible thing for me to talk about it in the episode. Mm-hmm. But when I first heard that, it was like, why? How is... And, and some of my rereading is like trying to make sure that... It, is it hidden? Is, is his anti-Semitism somehow being transmitted snuck under the wire Mm -hmm. and i can't find it yeah i mean i like i said i think he was smart enough to know that it wouldn't wouldn't have been accepted or you know uh we just read a whole section that was about how the editorial staff at his publisher was constantly fighting with him yeah maybe it was because they were like who knows yeah maybe they were cutting out the bits about the jews Yeah, yeah exactly and yet there's also, again, this duality because uh, even part of this unauthorized biography, it points out that when he married Felicity Crossland, the, quote, woodcarver with whom he had been having a long affair. The way, <laughs> the way you just said it, it made it sound like she wasn't a woodcarver. You oh, know, yeah, quote, woodcarver. woodcarver. No, no, I'm just I'm reading from here and I want to <laughs> I, I am not constructing this sentence this way. Uh he was described as having found a greater happiness and serenity yeah. with his second wife. Um, his daughter, Tessa, said, when in 1983 he wrote in The Witches, it doesn't matter who you are or what you look like as long as somebody loves you, he was a changing writer. My father had fallen in love. When he married my stepmother in the early 80s, everything altered. Okay, so so from that quote from his kid then... It seems like a lot of his personality uh, quirks or just downright offensiveness came from the fact that he was in an unhappy marriage. Mm. That seems to be what she's saying. Maybe. Uh, I don't know. I mean, the one thing you could say is the unhappy marriage might not have been just he didn't love his wife, but that the, uh, the stroke, like if he was resentful yeah. of yeah. his wife having a stroke, that's something different than just an unhappy marriage. Like something he couldn't handle the obstacle, right? The difficulty that entered mm-hmm. his life. 
And even the reviewer here says when you look at the the latter books that were written during his second marriage, quote, his natural acidity is tempered with sweetness. Each book centers on a relationship between a child and an adult, which is a dream of perfect understanding and companionability. So that is maybe starting to peek out in Danny Champion of the World, that like he was yearning for this uh, relationship with a with another human being where they fully understood him and, yeah. and uh, loved him unconditionally. What's interesting is that in The Witches, that relationship is between a grandmother and a grandchild. Right. They, he switches the roles out, right? Mm-hmm. And And I think what they're implying here, and there's even a quote here kind of talking about uh, how he and Felicity Crossland, you know, got along that basically he, he finally had that in a way that he'd never had it before. Yeah. And had it for real instead of writing it. Mm-hmm. But there's always in doll. And this is back to Danny, the champion of the world. There's always a triumphant child, not an adult. And, you know, we've been talking about why read horror on this show a lot. And in doing the research for this show, it's been revealed to me that in a way, doll is child horror or children's horror. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, here's another quote. I think this is from the Talbot piece. She says, children need the dark materials of fairy tales because they need to make sense, but in a symbolic and displaced way of their own feelings of anger, resentment, and powerlessness. Children also benefit from learning about violence and brutishness in fairy tales. Oh, this is from Bettelheim. Uh, It counters the, quote, widespread refusal to let children know that the source of much that goes wrong in our life is due to our natures, the propensity of all men for acting aggressively, asocially, and selfishly, Many of the fairy tales and most of Dahl's work are complex narratives of wish fulfillment. I think this is maybe where Ursula Le Guin got the comic book association. And let's also point out that this is Bruno Bettelheim writing in The Uses of Enchantment in 1976. Mm -hmm. But again, so he says the idea here is that these stories teach the reader, ostensibly children, that a struggle against severe difficulties in life is unavoidable. So no matter what, you're going to you're going to encounter these struggles. It's an intrinsic part of human experience. But if you don't shy away and steadfastly meet unexpected and often unjust hardships, you will master all obstacles and at the end emerge victorious. You know, that strikes me, Chris, as almost like a philosophically pessimistic attitude. Uh, yeah. Bettelheim's quote here. Yeah, that you just um You know, if one does not shy away, but meets unexpected and unjust hardships, one masters all obstacles and at the end emerges victorious, feels like the difference between you and life is bad and you have to handle it. Mm. You know, I I know that you romantic versus cynic thing again. (laughs) Yeah. I know that you like to get your digs in on me. No, this is not me getting a dig in. I read that and I was like. Bettelheim, I think you're putting a little bit too much faith in the idea uh-huh. that we can overcome <laughs> any uh, hardship as long as we just stand up in front of it. Right. I just want to point out that the, th- the thing you're saying about um, my gleeful enjoyment of what is in this book, which seems to be like excusing someone uh, writing a dysfunctional relationship. Mm. Or excusing someone who is uh, honoring a parent who is a bad parent, you know, I, I, I think that comes from this sort of polar opposite viewpoint that you and I occasionally reveal to each other. Yeah. So actually, let's take a second and examine this, because before you said that, I wanted to stop and, and look at this quote again. OK, let's review so Bettelheim is saying that all of life is about us eventually running into hardship that we don't deserve, but that it's okay as long as we learn to stand up against it and we will emerge victorious. Yeah. If you, you can handle it, yeah, you will continue. 
Do you believe that's true? No. Neither do I. <laughs> well, now I don't know where we're going to go with this. I think that you uh, have two competing narratives of your own that are so overwhelmingly positive that it would be extremely difficult for you to reconcile them with the like somewhat negative stuff that's in the research here. Both your own as a kid, you know, gleefully reading this book, enjoying it, and imagining, I think, from what you're saying, the kind of relationship Danny has with his father, with your own father, or another adult figure. Yeah. I mean, despite despite your disagreement with it, to me, this is a idealized parental relationship. Yeah. And that leads to my my idea of what I think your second positive narrative is, which is now that I'm a parent, I can form this idealized parental relationship with my child in the way that I did not have when I was a child. Except Talbot is able to uh, articulate my terrible fear about what you just said. <laughs> okay, in, go ahead. In a perfect way. And, and you know, to bring us back to Dahl, I've never read this quote from him, but when I did read it for the prep for this episode, it hit me really fucking hard. Mm. Roald Dahl said to an interviewer in 1988, I have a very strong and almost profound view on how a child has to fight its way through life and grow up to the age of, let's say, 12. All their lives, they're being disciplined. When you're born or when you're one or two or three, you're an uncivilized creature. And from that age, right up to 12 or 15, if you are going to become civilized and become a member of the community, you're going to have to be disciplined severely. Stop eating with your fingers and spitting on the floor and swearing and anything else you want to mention. And who does this disciplining? It is two people. It's the parents. Although the child loves her mother and father, they are subconsciously the enemy. There's a fine line, I think, between loving your parents deeply and resenting them. Who knew that Dahl was reading Michel Foucault? Right. The magic in Danny, the champion of the world, is that Danny somehow becomes an adult without ever being disciplined. Right. And he never thinks of his father as the enemy. Exactly. He is brought into maturity through wonderment and practice. The discipline that he uses is actually the sort of professional discipline or the mechanical, you know, discipline, i.e. Uh, devoting yourself to a practice and becoming good at it. Danny is a miniature adult. Yeah. Let's remember one thing here, though. I, I think you're absolutely right. But one thing to remember, and I don't think this would be Dahl's excuse, is that this story is told from Danny's point of view at right. age nine. So he is an unreliable narrator at best. And is wait, isn't Danny, who's writing the book, supposed to be grown Danny? I trying to write it as if he were nine? I don't think so. I could be wrong, but the very last chapter... It switches to present tense. Yeah. As if they, um, like, he's telling you this story right at the very end of it. Ah, I see. Yeah. I might have misread that this time around. So, and when I, I keep saying the magic of this, what I mean is the magical realism. The, the irrealism of it is that Danny becomes an adult without ever being disciplined. Yeah, I mean, I guess, so, like you... I see I, I see that represented in a story like this and I go, oh man, I wish I had had that. And then I think to myself, I can't, I, do I know a single human being who ever had a relationship with their parent where they weren't disciplined? Only from the outside, right? Only sometimes some people are very good at keeping the discipline out of the public view. Yeah. I suppose this is kind of like what the uh, the myth of the only child is, right? Like the idea that uh, the only child is is uh, this kid that never gets disciplined and, and grows up thinking they're perfect at everything. Let me toss a quote from the Talbot piece out here, which is perfect. Yeah. We believe that we understand and communicate with our children far better than our parents or grandparents did with theirs. 
And we therefore can't imagine that our kids could secretly feel oppressed by our reasonable and enlightened approach to child rearing. Dahl's books mercilessly upend this illusion of harmony. See, and right they there. do it now. Right? Yeah. They, they do it now. The, the imagining that we are better with our kids than our parents were mm-hmm. like, okay, boomer, you didn't, you put me on my stomach to take a nap and you smoked in the house with me. Right. <laughs> but does that make you feel better about your relationship with your own parents? The no. idea that everybody feels this way. Fuck no, man. <laughs> <laughs> no, I look, I know I blew it in many ways, but it wasn't like I was getting the, the full, um, you know, Danny's dad treatment and I threw it away. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I can't, I can't speak to that cause I wasn't there and Buck isn't here to defend himself. So let's go back to the Mary Ness piece, which, uh, appeared on tour.com actually. And, uh, Ness seems to really kind of zone in on the, the relationship between Danny and his father as being the, the real important theme here and says the real story is the relationship between Danny and his father. Danny knows poaching is wrong, both legally and morally, even leaving the question of hunting aside and that it's very dangerous because the local landowners will shoot poachers first and ask questions later. But in Danny's eyes, his father is the most wonderful, marvelous man on earth. So why wouldn't anyone want to help him? And yet this masks a potentially dangerous emotional dependency on both sides. I I think they mean both sides of the parent-child relationship. Apart from customers, the father and son seem to have few other social contacts, Danny has friends at school, but he never brings them by. He says that he would rather just hang out with his father. We catch glimpses of just how much his father misses his wife. Danny, who never knew her, does not have the same sense of loss, but he slowly grasps it through his father's story. This then adds a layer of guilt and loss that binds the two closer together. I would be worried, except that they really do seem to be having fun, and Danny knows that his father loves him. So this is... If you bring to Danny, the champion of the world, a sense that a kid might fool themselves into thinking that I would rather hang out with my father, you know, instead of my dad has sort of trapped me in this life where I can't connect to other kids. If you believe that Danny is an unreliable narrator because he's a kid, then it can be very creepy. Mm-hmm. And there can be like this this underside, this this dark this darkness behind it. But Dahl seems to present children as the ones who know themselves and are right. completely authentic. Yeah. So you take Danny at face value. You know, I didn't have very many friends, but that was fine because I would rather spend uh, every day with my dad than with anybody else. <laughs> then you can have that kind of idealized sense. I'm sorry. I'm laughing because... Uh, I don't know about you, but when I was working in academia and all of the boomers were trying to understand the millennials that we were teaching, what they would say is, you wouldn't believe it, but these people are actually friends with their parents. (laughs) (laughs) Oh my God. I didn't have this experience. That's amazing. You heard the term helicopter parents. Of of course. Of course. Yeah. yeah. But they, they would tell us like, you have to be ready because like, after you administer a test, the first person they're going to call after they take the test is their mom because they're going to want to ask their mom how they should feel. So it's almost like Danny Champion of the World is predicting boomer fear of millennials. (laughs) Let's let Mary sort of finish this off because she has a very subjective but um, incisive summing up of the book and the experience of reading the book. She says, oddly, for all the unpleasantness and moral dilemmas, in many ways, this book offers far more hope to children than Dahl's earlier works. And now, the earlier works, James and the Giant Peach is the first big kids book that Dahl wrote. And uh, that begins with his parents being killed by a wild animal that's loose from the zoo. And he is sent to live with his aunts, Sponge and Spiker, who are the worst people in the world. Have you read that one to Lila Jane yet? Oh, yeah. And they torment him 
and torment him and torment him until some magic comes along. The giant peach grows and then it rolls over them and kills them. And that's just the start of the book. I remember just a couple of years ago when she was terrified that bears were going to break into your house. There are no bears yeah. in James and the Giant Peach. There are men who live it's in the clouds. Just peaches that murder your family <laughs> and boars. <laughs> So she says, I remember disliking this book when I was a kid. So Danny, the champion of the world. I'm not sure why, possibly because the only characters I really felt sorry for were the poor pheasants who really do get a bum rap in this book. This is the way that the pheasants are killed. you right here. They don't even get shot. They get get killed by overdosing on sleeping pills. (laughs) Only like 12 of them. (laughs) So finally... Mary says, reading the book now, I still can't find myself liking it exactly, and I still find myself missing Dahl's over-the-top zany humor. But I can be impressed by Dahl's rich character development here and his respect for his younger readers and his understanding that sometimes parents can do things that it may be difficult to understand. So this actually seems like a a good point for me to kind of ask you to, to tie this up for me. Okay, so here we go. She, she's making this argument, right? Mary uh, Ness. She says that the idea here is Doll is just trying to let kids know, look, parents are going to do things sometimes and you may be upset about it, but it, they're difficult for you to understand because you're not an adult. Whereas uh, the other article seems to be arguing, no, like you as a child are inherently at war with your parents and like no matter what they are constantly oppressing you and disciplining you to teach you how to be a civilized member of society right so which one do you think is true or do you think they're both true i think the book danny the champion of the world is this inversion of becoming an adult The child who is sort of the saint in a way, you know, the perfect human is growing up and is given a chance to recognize that adulthood is not the absence of ambiguity or anger or um, moral uh, grayness, but instead that becoming an adult is when you are allowed to indulge these things. And that being a child is when you are restricted and you must be the sensible, mature one. You know, you have to keep your shit together when you're a kid or you will get in loads of trouble. But when you become an adult, then you're able to do so many more things, maybe things that you shouldn't be doing. You've been listening to Super Context, a podcast autopsy of media. How it's made and how it informs our everyday culture. Our theme music is Human Factor by Mile Marker. And right now you're listening to Drive Fast by Three Chain Links. Show notes and all our past episodes are available at supercontextpodcast.libson.com. You can email the show at supercontextpodcast at gmail.com to tell us what you like, what you don't like, and to suggest topics for future shows. And I'm available on Twitter as at Christian Sager. And I'm there at Bennett Radio. Two N's, two T's. 